Good evening, everyone. I'm Michelle Gray, the Director of Programming for the New York Times live conversation series, Times Talks, which pairs New York Times journalists with the brightest and boldest creative minds from the fields of film, theater, music, art, fashion, food, and literature. I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's event with Academy and Golden Globe winning actor and filmmaker Jodie Foster and Obie Award winning actor Rosemary DeWitt. The duo will discuss their creative process, their commitment to supporting women in Hollywood, and their upcoming project, the Emmy Award winning fourth season of Black Mirror, which is directed by Foster and stars DeWitt. Black Mirror taps into our collective unease with the modern world, and each standalone episode is a sharp, suspenseful tale exploring the themes of contemporary techno paranoia. Moderating the conversation tonight is Frank Bruni, a New York Times op-ed columnist who writes about politics, popular culture, food, and gay rights. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Frank Bruni, Rosemary DeWitt, and Jodie Foster. Thank you all for joining us, Jody and Rosemary. Thank you for being here. Um, before we begin, I want to let you know, after about 45, 50 minutes, we're going to open it up to questions from you. There's going to be a microphone on that aisle and on this aisle. And about three to four minutes before, those mic before you're supposed to line up there, I'll let you know. Um, and we'll just go from microphone to microphone. We will also be taking some questions that come to us from Facebook, if that's all right. Um, so that'll happen with about 15, 20 minutes to go. So if you have questions, think of them, and please line up when that moment comes. Um, we have a lot of fans of each of yours individually here, but we also have a lot of Black Mirror fans. So I wanted to begin, yeah, I can hear. Um, <laughs> we're gonna talk about your episode and a whole bunch of other things, but how did each of you come to this? Did you, did you know of Black Mirror beforehand? Were you a fan of the anthology and was it a thrill when they said, will you direct an episode or how did that come to be? I didn't know anything about Black Mirror. I think people had suggested it to me and I just hadn't gotten to it and I was um, meeting with an executive from Netflix and kind of bemoaning the state of the movie business, mainstream movie business, and saying, you know, I love, I love doing television but I really, uh, and, and cable, but I really love the short story form. I love a beginning, a middle, and an end and something that lasts anywhere between an hour and an hour and a half. I think is sort of perfect storytelling for me. And um, I, I don't want to let that go. I don't want to say goodbye to that I, in order to have these eight season arcs. So she said, do I have a show for you? Sent me a script. And it was just, it was kind of strange that it was so perfect for me. Yeah. Um, you know, I came from a single mom and all that kind of stuff. And um, then immediately binge watched. You know, <laughs> too many, too many black men. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> and how did you end up united with Jody for this particular episode. Jody sent it to me. And like Jody, I did I mean I'm right now I know home, I know Moana, I know <laughs> cars, you know, like I have a 2 and a 4 year old, so I'm just not watching Black Mirror these days. So, she sent it to me. It was a perfect piece of writing. You know, it was an indie film on the page. There was not a word that was off, you know, and it was Jody. So it was a no-brainer. I was, it, it, I was like, I couldn't believe my good fortune. And then I started watching the series, and then I locked myself in the closet and would cry a little bit. I'd go back and watch <laughs> the series, and then I stopped because I actually got very intimidated because they are all so good, and we had to go make one. So then I stopped, and I'm like, we have to go make our own. And ours felt very different in a way, in terms of, and I don't think these are spoilers. Ours, our episode is about two minutes in the future. You know, some yeah. of these are high concept. This is like America in just a few years from now. It's about parenting and technology. It's questions I navigate every single day. So I had an immediate in, and then I got to work with this one. <laughs> so I want you to tell everybody a little bit about the episode, but first we have a trailer that we okay. can show of the episode, which will ground you in it a little bit, so. I'm 2,000 years old, and I remember when we used to open up the door and just let the kids be. Sarah! 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 Hey! Hey, lady! Sarah! I found her! Oh, good. I'm so sorry. Sarah will be part of our trial period. Response so far is just incredible. <laughs> the sense of security, peace of mind. 
The stories we've been hearing, they are truly inspirational. It's completely safe. Sure it is, huh? It is, it is a terrific, terrific episode. What more can you tell us about the plot line without giving anything away? But that's sort of vague. Yeah, I, I mean, um, there, uh, there is a device uh, that you can use to make sure that your children are safe. Um, and in the future, very, very close in the future, uh, a mom who is slightly panicky about, about her child who gives birth, we, get to, we see her give birth, we see the child grow up, and um, she takes on this device, and uh, then as time goes, I'm terrible at doing these things. I'm terrible at telling <laughs> stories. It's not awful. I really, I can do it with the camera in my hand. I'm awful at talking about it. Um, but Rosemary, and then, and then stuff not. happens, yeah. and then things happen. Well, you know what it is? Is we're not allowed to say anything. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like you'll be outside. I'm not going to say anything. Over your head I'm and not really. Shot. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you just can't talk about the spoilers. So. Okay, but the theme is. Is, this, is the key to good parenting control and what is too much control, Well, and right? fear. We live in an age of fear and a low-level anxiety, especially around parenting and technology and what's too much and how to keep our children safe physically in the outside world and from technology. And this mother, my character, gets um, an opportunity to use technology in this way for safety. And then our, our, um, we, don't have, we, don't, we don't know how to use technology in a way, I think you said it, so you do know how to talk. Um, uh, you know, we, we will give you uh, a driver's test before you take your driver's license, but we will hand anyone a phone or an iPad, and there's no moral contract, you know, and there's no what, what are the boundaries. And, it, and you mean, know, there are cautionary tales, all of these episodes. Right. It's a great thing. I think the thing we love about Black Mirror is that the technology itself has, you know, it is is benign. The technology is, is as, as somebody said today, is a blender, basically. It didn't do anything wrong. It's just attempting to give you what you asked for. And um, it's, it is a mirror. It's a reflection of our own messed up psychology that what we desire and what we're asking from our technology is something that, that ends up being kind of twisted and psychologically damaged. You have a son who just started college, right? Yes. And another not so far. Right. So you have tonight. many years into parenting at this point. Yes. Did you have to develop, devise firm rules about technology and your children and what was the right and wrong use of it? Uh, yeah. And then the rules went out the window uh, as this happens. <laughs> and as the times changed, you know, you went from Game Boy, there was the Game Boy, then there was the, you know, the com computer, and then there were the handheld devices. And so, you know, all of that changed. Uh, I think we managed to do okay, but I also, you know, he, they're of a different time period, right? Because they're one born in 98, so it's a different time period. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the de device in this, uh, in this film has a number of different features. So it's not just helping to keep them safe, but it's also kind of living vicariously through them. Um, and that's the part that was very interesting to me, sort of personally, is that, you know, if, if you're, if, if a, a woman of a certain era, um, let's say my mom, mm. <laughs> let's say my mom mm. had a device that allowed her to live vicariously through my experience. Um, she would let's say it. it was a, let's <laughs> just say it was a movie camera. You know, um, uh, there, there's something kind of off about the, the interdependent, the symbiosis, that, that connection between mother and daughter when one is living through the other person's eyes. You told me a story once when we chatted before. Yes. I mean, on this whole kind of theme of, of parents getting too involved or not involved enough or whatever, um, about a time in your movie career when you had to sort of take a step away from your mother in terms of the advice she was giving you unsolicited at that point. Would you share that? Yeah. Oh, it was a kind of a weird movie. It was on Nell very quickly. It was on Nell. She was, she was offended by the fact that I, dyed my, I was dyeing my hair. <laughs> and she basically told me I was going to die and, you know, the apocalypse was coming because I was dyeing my hair. And um, didn't understand why I chose to do that, and and it was it really was it was almost like it didn't make any sense. It was a little crazy. I tried to explain the character, and at one point I wrote her a letter, and I said I can't talk to you for three months, and I need to not speak to you for these three months because you put fear in me, and if I have fear, I can't do my job. I mean, if I if the if I'm entering into a character and I make that commitment, and then suddenly I'm standing there going, oh, you know, I, I can't hear that voice. And um, she understood. She sent me flowers. And I talked to her three months later. 
And it all worked out in the end. It all worked out in the end. That's a good mom, though, right That there. was a good mom. <laughs> she <laughs> held the boundary. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that is what you have to do, which is you have to fight for your independence. That's what women do, is they fight for their independence from their mothers. And that process, which can be a terrible, violent struggle, um, is absolutely necessary in order for that person to survive and to evolve. Rosemary, how much do you, I mean, your, your kids are still very young. Mm -hmm. How much do you think about and worry about being, I think of this episode as the helicopter parent on really eerie steroids. Yeah. Um, was it kind of scary to work on this and wonder about where you draw the line in the future? Yeah, I mean, no. In a, in a weird way, that wasn't my jam, so to speak. You know, I took the baby monitors out at three months. I felt like I was spying on them. You know, like I'm like invading their personal space. You know, it was stressing me out. Um, no, for me, the piece was a lot more about exploring that sort of gauzy place between mothers and daughters and um, just the interconnectedness and the confusion around where does your life begin and end and where does my life begin and end. And Jody and I had lots of conversations about that. I mean, it's obvious. We all know that panic moment where they're out of your sight line. So I, you know, I had that to go into. But the layers upon layers of just that dynamic and navigating that dynamic. For me, my mother, my mother's deceased. She's been dead for like 24 years. And it was the most prof profound relationship of my life. And it comes up every single day as I mother. You know what I mean? And I heal it and as I hold my babies. You know what I mean? It's just I'm always in relationship with it. So every moment of this piece is full for me. So I don't even have to put it on the technology. Right. It's already there. You know what I mean? It's like just a very sticky thing. Just since it's a moment of your character with your child, let's, let's play the one other clip we have of this Black Mirror episode. If I wonder we what it is. And you can watch it there. <laughs> oh, I know I was doing that too. Or not. No, we're not doing it. <laughs> you want to act there it out? Go. Let's act it out. <laughs> Ms. Tembrell? Yes. And Sarah? Right? Follow me. Hi. You have a recommendation, so Sarah will be part of our trial period. Well, it's been tested, though, right? Of I mean, course. She's not like a guinea pig. Yes, it's all fully tested, okay. perfectly safe. This is just us fine tuning our subscription model before the full launch. And look at the kids. We're getting feedback on which features our customers use most in the real world. Uh huh. Move up. Ooh. Yeah. Response so far is just incredible. The sense of security, peace of mind. I mean, the stories we've been hearing, they are truly inspirational. Can you see the screen? I'm gonna get it. Okay, then. There you go. You like cartoons? Yeah. Yeah? Shimmer and shine? Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Okay. Then you watch that, and I won't be a moment, okay? This is the reason I showed that, but I want to ask, how do you direct a child actor, for lack of a better phrase, of that age? Um, well, the same way you, hopefully the same way you direct a regular actor with respect and all of that, and then occasionally you say, look at my finger, look at my finger, look at my finger, look at my finger. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a lot of that. Okay. <laughs> just, just do what I'm doing, just do what I'm doing right now. <laughs> she was, uh, she's amazing, this kid, and I do love directing kids. I've directed kids a lot, and, um, but, you know, Rosemary remembers when, when they're, you know, I asked her to do something, she's like, what if I do it like this? And she put her leg behind her behind her head and like spin around in a circle and I was like, no, let's, you know, there was, it was, it was challenging. <laughs> Four years old. Yeah, it's challenging. Could, could or would this story have worked the same way if that was a son rather than a daughter? I think it would have been a different movie. I How really so? do. I think it would have been a different movie. Um, I did Little Men Tate, my, my first film as a director, and uh, it is specifically about a single mother and her son. And that relationship is very strong and very interesting, but it's very different. It's, in some ways, it has a romantic quality to it. You do know that you are not them. You know, you know that they're different than you, and you marvel at their shoulders and the fact that they're, they're going to get a beard and all of these things that you will never know. And you, 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 have a, you are raising a man. What an amazing thing. You're actually raising a man, something you're not, you could never be, that's going to grow into somebody who will potentially be more powerful than you, um, at least obviously in the, in the feminist sense. 
uh, in terms of those questions, and that's a very different relationship. Rosemary? Yeah, I mean, I, f I feel like just even in the thinking, there's some really beautiful sort of sequences in the third act, second and third act of the episode, where there's sort of this dance of sort of lying and betrayal and whatnot. And, you know, men, I think, I don't know, seem, from having a husband, seem a little bit linear. You know what I mean? And there's something about the circling these women do that it's like kind of moving in a circle. There's a dance between it that women, that we know it in life where some things go unspoken, some things go unsaid. We very much move through the world from intuition, sometimes not intellect. And, and so it can get complicated. I mean, I talked to my husband and I said, do the girls miss me? You know, <laughs> yesterday. And he's like, yeah. I'm like, oh, how do you know? With the little one. He's like, she said, I hate mommy. And I was like, what? <laughs> and, he, and he goes, she'd never said that. And he goes, yeah, she said, I hate I hate mommy, I hate mommy, I love mommy, I, wish, I miss mommy, I want mommy, you know, and started crying because it's just not, it's girls, you know what I mean? We circle, we circle, we circle, and, and it's just a different, and we spoke a lot about that, and it's, and it's nice because if anything, and one of my favorite things about the, the episode is the way Jody directed it, is it's very, uh, there's not a lot of dialogue in it, you know what I mean? It's really most of what's said is said without words, you know? You, you've been directed by many different people. Is it different to be directed by someone who has such a long career as an actor herself? Oh, Frank. Yeah, it's um, it's it's What's in, that? it's intimidating. It's Jodie Foster. So here's the thing: <laughs> I can't complain. You know what I mean? You saw Silence of the Lambs and Panic. I can't believe it's hard to act with a screen. You know what I mean? <laughs> like she's done everything. She's done things that are way harder. She could act the S H I T out of this part. You know what I mean? Um, so there's a couple things. There's so much respect for the actor. It's so safe. There's some stunt work and some things that go on later in the episode. I was never taken such good care of. We never did one more take than necessary. She didn't want us to undergo anything harder than we had. I mean, it's like having a good mom on set, and I'm not necessarily used to that. And that's not a, a woman director. That's just a person who's been doing it for 52 years, you know. And like you said, you do. You talk to the five-year-old the same way you talk to me with the same kind of respect. It's magical. And a lot, there's a lot of freedom that she comes in and says one word. <laughs> Don't do that anymore. You know what I mean? Or <laughs> less. You know, or, and goes away and gives you, you know, it's, it's dreamy. And I hope it's the beginning, you know, and I hope she directs 900 more. That you're in, Irene. Right? <laughs> that I'm in. <laughs> Do, do you experience moments, whether it's in this one, which is a part, as Rosemary said, you could play, or whether it's in other movies you've directed, where you wish you could hop onto the other side of the camera because there's a part, a scene, a performance going on that you'd love to try yourself? Not very often. Uh, sometimes when I'm having trouble. You know, when I'm having trouble, I just want to go, God, just move over, let me do that. <laughs> um, uh, but, the, no, I, I really love being, you know, I love sitting back and watching what actors do, and so often I just marvel at them. I, I'm amazed at what they bring to the table, and I always think, like, I can never do that. That's amazing. I can never do that. And then I realize, of course, I do do that. It's just, um, I, I have so much respect for, for the mystery of what they do. And, look, I've directed myself quite a bit, too, and I'm never, I, I'm always satisfied with what I get, but I'm never thrilled with these new things because I just get what I anticipated. Which is harder? Which side of the camera? Uh, they're both hard for totally different reasons. Um, you know, the directing is hard because you are, in, you are ultimately in control of everything and it's all your fault. Um, every decision is yours and you have to be able to see the big picture at all times and it's exhausting. Um, but to me, there, there's, to me that's freeing to be totally in control. The hardest thing for me, a much harder thing, is to be a performer and to have to never know whether you got it right. You know, it's not like foam or no foam. It's something in between always, and you never get what somebody else anticipated or what you anticipated. It's just something that happens between action and cut. And the formlessness of that and the not knowing of that is causes a lot of anxiety. Well, if my memory is correct, you told me that initially and for a long time, you were intensely dissatisfied with your performance in The Accused. You thought it would be the oh, end yeah. of your career. Yeah, I thought that was, I thought that was done. So I did, took the Why? GREs and thought I was going to grad school. Uh, I, I, th I kind of thought, honestly, I was young. I was only 26 years old, and I really thought I was bad. Uh, I guess because 
I had created a character, which I think was a truthful character, who was brash and vulgar and annoying and loud and said things she shouldn't have said and did things that she shouldn't have done. And I, as a waspy girl, was kind of offended. Uh, when I saw it, I thought, oh my gosh, she's just too brash and too, you know, she's too annoying and, you know, how dare she say that thing out loud. Um, and it wasn't until later that I realized that, um, that I had created a character that was so different from me, that, I, that in some ways that I couldn't really relate to, that, that I think I was, I was almost ashamed of. Um, and then I grew to understand that that's not what I need to be ashamed of. Are you self-critical that way about your own work, your own performances? Do you get that insecure about them? Well, I understand that vulnerability. I remember finishing up, uh, we both worked with Jonathan Demme, and he always used to retell me the story of at the rap party, I was like drinking a beer and dancing, going, I'm not Rachel. I'm not, like I wanted him to get to know me. Like I didn't want him to think I was so uptight, you know, and all these things. I'm not as critical as I go on because I don't really feel like it's me. You know what I mean? It's such a collaborative art. I just, like, so much of my performance in there is conversations with Jody, is stealing from people I see on the street and whatnot, that I, um, I don't, I, I, I mean, there's the great feeling of, like, when you know you got a scene, but most of the time, it's, you know, you go home, you, you're leaving set, you're like, did we get it, really? Uh, all right. You know what I mean? And you just, you just always live in this kind of unease of it all, so you trust that someone else, and then they go in the editing room, you know what I mean, and they put music under it, and there's just so many people, it's kind of vain to even think you have anything to do with it, in a way, you know what I mean, you're kind of like a vessel for Charlie's words, and you know, it's a great big circus. How long did you have for this one? How long was this shoot? I don't remember, except it wasn't enough. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't remember, I blocked it out. Every time somebody asks me a question like that about this movie, I have blocked it out. I th Four I weeks? Was that what it was? I can't remember. No, make it wasn't up, quite four weeks. Make up I think it was three weeks and a little bit. Okay. I mean, this all of Black Mirror is sort of all about the Pandora's box of technology. Yes. Like, what have we done? Going even away from this episode, in, what do you worry as you kind of watch the state of the world? We were talking about mm -hmm. the news backstage. Where do you get really scared that technology is leading us astray? Um, I don't think te technology is doing it. I, I think it's, you know, we have created this technology, as I said, to, to accomplish these things that we want. And I think that we don't really understand that we created something that thinks faster, um, millions and millions and millions of times faster than we could, and, and that we haven't adjusted ethically to the monster that we've created. Give me an and, example of that that you've seen that troubles you. Well, Wall Street, um, you know, the, the, what happened with high-frequency trading, uh, glitches, um, the fact that you know one company lost uh, was you know ninety million dollars in ten minutes, and every single person in that company was lost their jobs, and I mean that only happened. They called that a, that in incident was called a fat finger incident, which means that somebody put their finger on something for too long, so there was one too many zeros or two too many zeros, so a fat finger happened and basically the world exploded. Right. And I, I think, you know, now we're, uh, we're we, we could very well be looking at a global financial meltdown very, very soon. This is partly what Money Monster was about. Yes, yes. Yeah. What about you? I'm not as smart as Jody. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's true. <laughs> um, you know, you guys are so engaged and alive right now. No, but we've done some other sort of group things today, and people are just in the back. Yeah. You know, like, like, and I'm like, are we so boring? Or, <laughs> but if they're glazed over. They're like anesthetized to stuff because of this. Well, this is a New York Times yeah. event. Uh, Come on. Well, yeah. <laughs> we just, bring out the quality. Yeah, yeah, that's what it is. Um, it's just, I get scared of how it's rewiring us and changing us and like in our children and stuff. Someone told me, one of my girlfriends, I saw her last night and she said, I was at the airport the other day and I saw a couple fighting and then their plane was about to take off and they stopped, they stood in front of a backdrop, smiled and took a picture <laughs> and then started fighting again. And there's such a craziness about like what we're presenting and what we're, that I don't get it. Like, I feel old, and I'm not that old, you know? And there's just something about it all that I don't get. And I know I have to pay attention to it because I want to do a good job for these little people that are going to come after us. But I kind of want to unplug and go out to the mountains, but I know that's not the answer, you know? 
Let's talk a little bit about the current moment and something that came up backstage, which you said I could ask you about out here. Okay. Um, and you too, although your children are further along, what is it like to raise kids in the Donald Trump era? Can you, you start? Because I might start crying. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, well, I like to be positive. <laughs> really do like to be positive. Um, and it's, you it's, weren't like 25 I minutes was. ago. <laughs> it's, it's, hard, it's hard to be positive. Um, but I, you know, we, my kids are 19 and 16. And um, they, you know, they were asleep because Obama was at the wheel. I think they were like, oh, yeah, everything's fine. We have social justice. We have, you know, LGBT rights. We have all these things. Uh, that they took for granted was, they knew that bullies were bad. They knew that, um, that the Constitution was sacred. They knew that the rule of law was important and that people go to jail that do bad things. And um, then all of that was overturned in you know, a day. And I think that um, as unsettling as that moment was for them, and it was really unsettling for them, I think people, they were just completely confused that, um, uh, well, for all, the, for all the reasons we know, um, they are really interested in fighting back. And I think that they've really woken up to, to being committed and to being part of a collective and to asking questions and to being alert and saying, I want to be a part of, you know, I want to be a part of fighting for what I know is right. And I, that's really encouraging to me. And I really do feel like the millennials now, these young people um, coming of age at this time are really at a really interesting times in, in terms of their engagement. Yeah, there, we went to the Women's March together. Yeah, we did. With your sons, and they yeah. wore their pink hats and scarves pink everything. and everything. And there were a lot of young men and kids, you know, just there. And it was like so inspiring to being the next, you know, the older generation and to see how engaged they were and how empowered they were. It, was, it felt like the happiest day of the year, actually. Yeah. It was, there was a giddiness to it where everybody had been you know, felt like they'd been in their bathtub, you know, with, I don't know, pouring olive oil on themselves. They were so happy. <laughs> I don't know why that's what I thought of, but that's what came out of my mouth. I can't wait till that hits Twitter. Jody yeah. Foster uses olive oil. I don't know what that was. I just thought, I just saw the can on my head. That's all yeah. I saw. And, um, and then suddenly there we were outside on a beautiful day, and everybody was in a silly, whimsical hat. Yeah. And they, we'd all made things, and you know, in LA, we don't have community. We don't walk. And then there they were. There was yeah. like a million people, and they ran into people they knew, and it really was. It was like the happiest day. It was like the happiest day of the year. Yeah. And yeah. I think it would be great if we could all find moments like that throughout the week. You know, if you can do one thing, whether you know, I for, like, I, when you go on the airplanes, they give you these little pouches. And it gives, you know, you have a toothbrush and you have all these things. And I don't know why. I've collected like hundreds of these for some reason. And um, I, I thought like, what? why do I not put these in my car? And when I see somebody who needs one of these pouches, give them the pouch. You know, if you can find one thing that you do every single day that allows you to feel like somehow you're committed to positivity and to making things better. Um, anyways, I think that's where kids are now. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel, again, my kids are too little to to sort of know what's going on, you know? But the only way I can model for them what I want them to learn is to basically, like, everyone has to become an activist. You know what I mean? Not only are they gonna say, what were you doing? How did it happen? How did it get to this? But I think they need to see us, um, you know, move it forward. It, it, it's hard not to feel kind of helpless in it, you know, is what we were talking about backstage. But, um, but it's in everything we do. You know what I mean? It's, in, it's just, it, you know, for me, I just, it, it became that at home, you, you, we really crystallize our values now because you have to carry them out because if they're on TV, getting questioned all the time and, and the things that we see as beautiful as inclusion are kind of not what some people want and that's what we have to reckon. I, just, I have to say, I feel like this moment in time is redefining patriotism. I've never felt so patriotic in my life. Yeah. I mean, I hate to say it, I do the flag, I do the hand over the heart, I do all of that. Why do you because, hate to say that? Well, because in my era, in the 70s, and when it was Vietnam, you know, the flag didn't mean that. It meant wars, and it meant, you know, uh, racism about Asians. I mean, it did not mean what it means today. And, um, it doesn't, doesn't mean then what it means to me now. I what mean, does it mean to you now? You know, to me, it really does mean fighting for all of the struggles, uh, social justice struggles that we've, we've 
what, what's happened in the last 20 years of, of, of uh, you know, doing what's the d democracy and, and hopefully becoming a better person and, um, yeah, values. Isn't that amazing that liberals feel like values is, is, is theirs? <laughs> remember when they used to be, remember that when they used to say that we had no values? That was before Roy Moore. That's true. <laughs> But uh, yeah, it's made me incredibly patriotic, and uh, my kids make fun of me. I'm totally patriotic. I, you know, I have little things of the Constitution. I hand them out to people. <laughs> <laughs> no, she you're right. Olive oil over her head. <laughs> Why I'm like, I mean, she slipped. <laughs> yeah. We, you talk about social justice. We are obviously in the midst of an enormous, intense conversation about sexual abuse, sexual harassment, sexual misconduct. A lot of it set in Hollywood. I mean, as these stories are being told and coming out, do these portray the Hollywood that you've been working in for the last decades? Is this, is this what you two experienced or saw? Uh, I mean, I, I've been working in the business for 52 years, and um, I, I, no, not at all, not remotely. And um, however, I know that these stories exist because I believe the women, and uh, I also know that it's not just the film industry. I mean, of course not. It's, uh, it's pretty much everywhere. We do every single day. There's, I mean, there's every woman in this room, I'm sure, says me too. I don't, I've never met a woman that hasn't had uh, sexual harassment or se sexual insensitivity in their lives. Um, and it's something that is, is, has become foundational to us. It's in some ways made us, by its negativity, has some, somehow made us who we are, stronger and weaker. Um, mm -hmm. It is an amazing time to hear these narratives, uh, but it's also, I, I also believe there's a next step which I'm really looking forward to, uh, where we have a truth and reconciliation and it, and in, it isn't just um, finally getting out uh, trying to see justice through Twitter. I mean, it would be great if we were able to really have repair and healing. Um, that would have been great after the Civil War What would War repair well. look like? Um, I think it has to happen on all fronts. We have to have rules that people understand that are not just gray area. And I think that for millennials, that's really a problem because they're like, wait a minute, what are the rules? Uh, um, but we also have to have a kind of group therapy, I think, where we can be in a room, uh, men and women and everybody can be in a room and say, I felt this, and somebody else can say, well, I was confused and I felt that. Because um, everybody has a perspective and it is, it's valid to have those conversations. And um, I don't think that we can put virtually almost every single man over 30 in jail. So I think we have to... I, I hope not. No, I mean, I, I, <laughs> I, I think that um, uh, when you live in a bubble, you don't realize you're in a bubble, and those people that have lived in that bubble have to, you know, they have to come to terms with the reality that's now, the reality of the women that, uh, that are affected by it. Have these stories had a lot of resonance for you? Yeah, I mean, they've, it just feels like the world we've always been living in. I mean, for me, it starts in seventh grade. You know, two minutes in the closet is like, <laughs> get your dukes up, you know. You're, in the ages that we're seeing, especially the women who are vulnerable, who are taken care of, who are taken advantage of, is this very specific time where as a woman, you are just um, like on display and it's like, you feel like the world feels like entitled to you, to your youth or your beauty if, or, or, or your whatever. You know, there's something amazing that comes with age and invisibility and whatnot. So I think for me, it's a lot about educating our young men, not just on consent, but just on like humanism and people humanism. and equality. Um, but yeah, that is my Hollywood. I, I mean, I'm a different person. Like, I mean, you know, I worked with Harvey Weinstein. He wasn't interested in me as, in a, as an actress or as a woman. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't know. I don't, he just yelled at somebody and kept on going. You know, it was fine. But, um, and I'm not offended by that, I, you know, especially after hearing the stories. I, I, but I also feel like if I, I can't count the times that other actors have put me on their lap like I'm a toddler. You know what I mean? Just, they're just feeling ownership to, to me. You know what I mean? Like there's something. Because some, why would they feel that way? I don't know, because you're a culture. Because it's, it's culture. the culture. And I can't tell you how many times I just giggled and laughed and tried to get out. You know what I mean? And, I remember with one specific, you know, famous person getting fired on the spot, I had the feeling of, oh my God, wow, they're serious about this. 
like they really like us. Like they value us. They're going to start listening to us and things are going to change. And I was kind of, I feel stupid and embarrassed that I even felt that way. And I, I feel like if anything where I've done my very small girls a disservice is in my effort to not make them people pleasers and pu feel puppeteered, I almost didn't, my four-year-old, now I'm hammering manners on her and she's like, what's going on? But it's like, I'll say, oh, you want to give grandpa a kiss goodbye? She's like, I don't have to. And I'm like, no, you don't have to, but it might be nice. You know, he loves you. Um, but I've just gone so far the other way, because like we talk about in this piece, we want so much more for our kids. And that was painful struggle that I couldn't name until now. Just all the constant manipulation of myself to be in the male gaze. It's exhausting. And I'm happy to be 46, and nobody's looking as much. You know what I mean? Right. Or, so yeah, it's not that like anyone's bad in Hollywood. It's everywhere. I worked, I, you know, I was a waitress and a bartender for 15 years before I got lucky enough to work as an actor. And it was, I'm honest, it was worse there, you know. So uh, it's just we just want it to change. Jody said something amazing today. I'm going to out you when they were talking about Me Too. She's like, I think really all we're asking is for it to stop. You know what I mean? It's not like we want to go on something and just have everybody arrested and lose their job. It's just like, can we stop it? Like, we'll be fine. Like, we'll say, uncle, like, we're out. Like, can we just go to work and it, it be cool and do our job? And can we grow and not have to raise our voice an octave when we talk to you? Yeah. And consciousness, I mean, is, it's tough. You know, just because you legislate something and you create rules doesn't mean, you know, and it happens in one day, doesn't mean the next day everybody understands the consciousness of what that is. It takes time and it takes a commitment for a culture to change, and it does change incrementally. The rules are important, but it's what happens next after that. Yeah. And, well, I, I think you said it with like group therapy. I don't think it happened with race in America. Right. I think we changed the legislation and didn't really get together and talk about difference and see, like we notice difference. We, you know what I mean? We see it. And we didn't come together and understand how we're different and how to work together. So now I think we have a lot of reckoning to do. To, to understand that it's, it's our country and it's our problem as huma as humans, not just a women's problem or a man's problem. It's our problem in the same way that this is our country, blacks and whites. And, and um, to understand, you know, this is what we do as actors, this is what we do as artists, is to understand experience, is to live through other people's stories. You know, I have to say, you know, I, I was, by the time I was three, I was in the movie business and I had, you know, they were all, they were just guys. There was no women. There, I sometimes was a lady who played my mom and maybe a script supervisor, and that's about it. Occasionally a makeup person, but pretty much it was all guys. And I was raised by these wonderful brothers and fathers that taught me how to, you know, make weird things out of wood and taught me how to, you know, focus pole and uh, they taught me what a camera was and they taught me manners and they protected me. And I know that in some ways, you know, there were moments in my life, of course, where I felt her a, a certain amount of sexual difference or harassment, but there was a lot of dads and brothers looking out for me. As I listen to you say that, I wonder, are we in danger right now of painting with too broad a brush when we're talking about men and aggression? Well, that's what happens in a moment of crisis, in a watershed moment. It is painful, and it's, 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 it's going to be very difficult. I just, that's why I'm looking forward to the next step. This step is Im important, significant, and you know, we need to have this step right now, but it's, uh, it's very painful to watch. When we talk about women in, in film and TV and Hollywood and entertainment, whatever, I mean, it's a bigger subject than just this last bit we've been talking about. Are things opportunity-wise, professional opportunity-wise, getting better? Is it usually significant that Patty Jenkins had this amazing hit with Wonder Woman, or is that a one-off? What do you make of the past year? Um, well, I, I, you know, gosh, it's really rough. As I said, the one, uh, you know, there, there is women. There are women in the film business now. Little by little, this has happened, right? Technicians and crews and executives and writers. Uh, there's a, quite a lot of parity now, especially on uh, in, in television. Uh, but the one area that just does not budge is mainstream uh, Hollywood movies are not directed by women. Why? Uh, I think it's, I don't think it's a plot where there was a bunch of guys that sat in a room with mustaches and twirled it and said, let's keep the women out. You know, I think, uh, I think it was unconscious to begin with, but I think a lot of it is about who we choose as leaders. And psychologically, I think that when you're about to hand over 30, 40, 50, 150 million dollars to somebody, you want them to look like you. You know, you want them to have gone to the same club that you went to. You want to, you, you want to have that 
feeling that this risk, this enormous risk that you're taking, you're taking on with somebody that you trust is going to think the way you think. And um, that's just, that's, that's like race psychology. You know, that's where you get in trouble. Right. Do you think, are you hopeful? Do you see things that have happened? I am. I mean, we see it, certainly. Like, we're talking about, t you know, television shows. I mean, the, there's exciting stuff happening yeah. in TV right now. And, like, The Handmaid's Tale. You know, there's so many. And there's so many there's great parts for women. And at the same time, um, that invisibility that happens with you just as a woman out in the world, that happens with your stories, too. So, you know, I, you know this is a, not only a, a, Charlie writes really good women, not only is it a story about a mother and a daughter, it's told through the lens. It's a very female story, like from the female perspective, the mother's love and fear. Um, I remember working on Olive Kitteridge, that was a really satisfying mm. experience. But those are, I, I would say they're still small to come by. I mean, Wonder Woman also has a lot of, um, stuff for the men to appreciate too, you know what I mean? <laughs> what would that be? Yeah, no, so I, I just think, you know, I wonder, there's, there's women, uh, you know, it's not just women, it's people of you know, ageism, like we don't value older people in this culture necessarily. There's stories to be told past 40 and 50 and 60 and 70 and 80 if you're lucky to long. I'm curious about those and no one's gonna write a check for $200 million <laughs> to tell it and then give it one. So I don't know, I don't know what shifts it. And some of it is just like logistical. I mean, I used to make jokes like whose wife is it this time? You know, who do they want me to play? Who do I get to be married to? But I'm more interested in my kids than that. So Jody has to be the one to call to get me. And that's a very specific choice. It's not anti-feminist. It's just, it's a instinctual thing of where I want to be. I don't know what, I'm not a sociologist, so I don't know what to call it, but you do disengage as a woman at a certain age, to, or you go focus on other things, you know? Yeah. Other th and there's also second life. You know, first life is about reputation and fortune and fame and success, and second life is more introspective, and that's a harder story to tell, too. We're, we're gonna go in a moment okay. to your question, so if you'd begin lining up, that would be great. Oh, cool. And while you're doing that, I'll ask you just a few last questions sure. and we'll turn it over to them. Um, you mentioned Charlie Booker. Uh -huh. Every time I watch a season of Black Mirror and I look at the credits, you've had some exposure to him. How does he write this <laughs> much so well? Mm -mm. Nobody can figure it out. He writes every single one of these and he also, um, he's, he's this very famous uh, political comedian and he does like an hour long show that is just him at the end of the year that's all about, that's a wrap up of all the politics that's happened. And it is amazing, it's an amazing thing to see. So he's, I don't know, he is the busiest person alive. Mm -hmm. he, um, he does, he is chained to his typewriter most of the time and Annabelle Hit Jones, his producing partner, is the one who's in the field with the uh, directors. So he, so he allows himself the time that way? Yes, yes. And Jody, before we go to the audience, you have spent I think more time in recent years directing than acting. Right. But someone like me who grew up with you as an actress, I mean, I, I, I love seeing you on screen. I love seeing you. How much more acting will we get to see from you? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I just did a movie this summer. Uh, it's the first time I've worked in five years, and it was a nice experience, a first-time director. And um, What was the part, and what, what made you kind of come out of? I, I play a almost 70-year-old uh, Seventy? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, this kind of, she's sort of a shut-in. Someone a nurse. who hasn't been using enough olive oil. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah and uh, she's, um, she's a nurse and uh, taking care of people and kind of agoraphobic and hasn't left this, almost this one room for the last 28 years. And it's called? It's called Hotel Artemis. And it's coming out when? I don't know. Right. I don't, yeah, I never know these things. Um, so I, look, I, I've worked for a long time as an actor, and there's only so many years that you can do the exact same thing over and over again. Um, I really, I really love to love what I'm doing, and um, I don't want to have cynical reasons for doing it. And uh, so I work very little as an actor, uh, but when I do, I love it. So when I do, please go because it, it's really something that I'm committed to. Um, and I'm very excited about the work that I'm going to do in my 60s and 70s. I think more excited than the work that I'm doing in my 50s as an actor. Um, I just, I'm looking forward to the, that kind of transformation. Um, uh, yeah, so. We will so start. Thank you one. very much, uh, Jody and Rosemary. Thank you for being here. You two are a total inspiration uh, for women in Hollywood and the women in, in the working world. Uh, I'm here with my wife and my 16-year-old daughter. 
who is an aspiring actor, director, writer, Yay. producer. Yeah. Yay. Wow. Um, so if you had one piece of advice to give our 16-year-old daughter, wow. I'd like to hear it from both of you, what would it be to coming up in this business? <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> that's a tough call. Wow, that's a lot of responsibility. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Try. Um, Forget about what I said earlier about time <laughs> You know, even as an actor especially, but also as a director, um, and as somebody who's over 40, uh, I spent too many years worried about what other people were gonna think, was gonna, were gonna think of my work, and I think it made my work worse. I think the best work that I've done is when I've said, you know, this is what I believe, and I don't care how it's, how it's going to be received. I really just want, I really want to do something that I think is absolutely honest. And sometimes that thing is really humble. It means it's not right to use the big, magnificent crane. It's right for it to be just, just a you know, wide shot of one person kneeling down. Um, so to have your choices come from a really honest place as opposed to you know, trying to play the room. I mean, I would just say rock your instrument. You know what I mean? Like you, like full on you and don't fit into any box and you have time. Mm -hmm. I think that's the thing young people never realize is you have so much time. Like careers are so long mm -hmm. that like you can really take your time to find your voice. I, I, I think right now in particular, the young people I know in the Kardashian of it all feel like they're not successful because you need a million things on the Twitter thing, you know, like whatever. You really have time to find out who you are and the world needs it. Like they need your original voice. Oh, it's so hard to talk to young people. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, there's two sides. Yeah, we're gonna go over here now. Um, room full of Black Mirror fans, usually when we get together, we talk about what's your favorite episode, what's your favorite episode. Right. So I would like to hear you guys talk about your favorite episodes, obviously from the first three seasons. Yes. But also, as someone who's asked to create and be part of this, what was the episode that made you feel the most intimidated? Oh my God, you want me to join the list of you know, episodes that include that? Like what really sort of like, as a creator, made you go, oh my God? I like all the darkest ones. Um, I love the Waldo moments. I feel like that one is really appropriate for this time uh, in, our, in our political life. Um, uh, I really like the sick Christmas one with John Hamm. <laughs> um, and I also like the really indie one. I think it's called Shut Up and Dance, where it's just like two guys in a car driving around and, you know, trying to save their own lives. Um, yeah, I like, you know, I like the ones that are complicated and emotional and dark. I like all those as well. <laughs> and I also like the ones that just make me like discover something new. Sometimes I'm just so actory. Like I like the playtest one. I love oh, discovering his acting in that way. I love the one Be Right Back. You know, with the, I love the subtleties of that. They're, the cool thing about it is there's something to love in all of them and you can pick and choose and go back to it. And you know, I think this season we have ours which is super indie. It has like a, a film. There's one that's in black and white. There's one that's 30 minutes. There's one that's like Star Trek and crazy. You know, so it's so cool that it just feels like, although I will say the people, the young, young audiences like are obsessed with all of them, yeah. you know, so. The, the pig episodes. The pig, yeah. Mm -hmm. I had to pause that one for a second. <laughs> yeah. Um, we're gonna go to a Facebook question. Okay. This is quite a change of pace. And I, I don't think, I think we'll all know which people are being thought of in this question. Can we separate art from the person who created it? Mm. A very timely question. That's a really interesting one. I, I, it, I mean, this is that, from Jason. Jason, I should say. I think Jason the question is, is can you? And some people can and some people can't. Um, and both of those are valid. I mean, I think some people really can't. Um, uh, yeah, that's my short answer. Um, so, sometimes I'm able to and sometimes I'm not. Uh, and, and sometimes, you know, the baggage that, a, you know, I did a, a film with Mel Gibson uh, called The Beaver that's about uh, a man who is really, who's lost and who is at the worst bottom of his life and will do anything in order to not kill himself. And I, I think Mel did an amazing job. I think it was an amazing performance because it came from a really, uh, a place of somebody who really understands what it is to be devastated and to be disappointed in himself and really wants to change and wants to rise. And I, I think that's really what made, the, what made his performance so extraordinary. 
uh, but it's also what made a lot of people not want to go see it. All right. Yeah, I mean, I, I like what you said. I, I sometimes am really sensitive and have, a, I mean, I can't personally separate myself from what I do. You know, like it's all me in there. So I tend to, in this moment, and again, like I said, be modeling for my kids. There's some things I don't need to engage in or pay money to see or people to work with right now because it doesn't feel right, right. to me personally. Personal. And, you know, we can change and grow. And I believe in people. <laughs> you know, I give them chances. You know, we'll see. Over there. Um, hi. Um, as we talked about, your career, Jody, has been amazing. Is there one like best day? Obviously, I'm sure you've had a lot, but like a best day of your life that really sticks out, whether it was like your first casting call or a part that you got that you really liked, <laughs> just something amazing in your career that really sticks out. And can you talk a little bit about why it's amazing or important to you? Uh, you know, Little Man Tate is really a highlight in my life. You know, my first movie as a director, it's the it's really the only thing I ever wanted to do my whole life was direct. It's really the one career desire that I had. And um, uh, probably that first day of shooting, you know, first day of shooting, of being on set and realizing that it had actually happened and that I was on my way. Um, that was probably the biggest moment for me. Uh, first, I have to say, Jody, huge fan of yours. You were a big influence growing up. My dad actually gave you my college essay earlier. Um, <laughs> oh, yes, I, I just read it in the car. <laughs> I don't know how so I'm, great. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> I haven't read it in 20 years, so I don't know how embarrassed I should be. Um, but on the subject of uh, technology uh, and film, there's been obviously a lot of changes within the film world. Um, how do you guys feel like as far as positives and negatives and if it has affected the way that you draft or the way that you act? Um, like you mean shooting on there's, film? There's some film? really yeah. positive things that have happened uh, in the film business, of technology. The first and foremost for me is that when you, now that we have cameras that you can carry around in your pocket and you can beam to people, um, you can look at a location, uh, you can look at an actor, and it all happens within seconds. It used to be we had to, they had to go to the one-hour photo, they had to tape it up with a bunch of tape, and they had to put it on a manila, and then they had to put it in Federal Express, and they had to send it to you, and then you had to look at it and go, God, I wish they panned more of the right. Yeah. You know? So that, that, that's changed everything. It's all, CGI has changed so many things. The fact that CGI is available to everybody else, um, things that used to require you to think about it and spend millions of dollars now can happen just on an avid within seconds. Yeah, I mean, good and bad, you know, in terms of like sort of the, the, the YouTube of it all, it's great that everybody has a voice and can tell a story. I think our attention span has gotten shorter, you know what I mean, for sometimes the stories that we can tolerate. And then, you know, Sean Baker, who did the Florida Project, which I'm in love with, you know, shot his last movie on the iPhone. So it's great that it did, it's not a, an elitist thing, you know what I mean, like where you have to get all this funding and like you can do it with your friends and that's really inspiring. And also because you can do it with your friends, you can do a lot of dumb shit with your friends that nobody needs to see, you know, so there's that too. Um, we'll do another Facebook question. This comes from Rita, and I want to ask it because we were talking about women in Hollywood, and mm. everyone talks about Wonder Woman and Patty Jenkins. Um, Greta Gerwig mm. did something very, very interesting and significant and fantastic this year. This comes from a fan of that, obvious. What do you two, if you saw it, think of Lady Bird, and how, does the mother do how do the mother-daughter dynamics in that Great. film compare to those on the Black Mirror episode? <laughs> Well, I'll yeah. tell you what, I'm embarrassed to say this because I don't get out of the house much, so I'm waiting for my ladybird screen, <laughs> and it hasn't come yet, you know, because this is like a big night out for me right now. In general, Greta Gerwig is one of those people that I'm talking about. I feel like she paved that road for herself. Like, her voice is not only, like, imprinted on all the roles she plays, but in the collaborations and the stories she tells from the mumble core till now. So it's the one film I'm dying to see, so I can't speak to it. I can say, not having seen it, I was really sad she wasn't nominated for a Golden Globe today. I, I um, mainly also just because the whole thing is like, it's the highest score ever on Rotten Tomatoes. You know what I mean? Like, it's yeah. like, I know it's good. So those boys better be pulling some genius stuff out. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, when I see I all their movies. When I saw that about the Gold, having just seen Lady Bird, yeah, when yeah. I saw that about the Golden Globes, I wondered, is yeah. this because she's a woman? Is that the wrong? <sighs> Gosh, I don't know. Did it's you see the Golden Lady? Globes, though? I know, Golden Globes I know. is like 60 people named It's Fun. They're not, it's not like, it's, it's, they're, they really are, they're 60 people. I hope you aren't looking for a nomination in the future. No. I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not saying they don't have, you know, a taste or anything. I'm just saying that it's, it's really just 60 people that got around and sat around a table and were like, what do you think? I don't know, what do you think? It's, it's, uh, they're, they're, 
the, you know, they're from newspapers in all over the world, from Romania to, you know, who knows what that zeitgeist, that, that, that zeitgeist is. Uh, um, as we're hoping maybe, you know, the Academy is different, but the truth is she made an awesome movie. She's a fantastic actress, a wonderful filmmaker, and um, that really is an honest movie. And to, to see a woman channel her own story through a wonderful actress like Cersei Ronan, you know, that, that is a, uh, a new thing, this uh, woman's gaze, and uh, mm -hmm. to be able to see through a camera a woman's eye and her experience uh, is it's just great. And, you know, trophies, Oscars, I know, I just want to say one thing about awards. It's like my husband one time said it. It's like a lot of time, and again, it's not that these aren't all amazing projects, but the award aspect. It's like a lot of times we give awards to like, you know, like the strong man who was like, mm, and he shows you how strong he is. <laughs> And sometimes, like Jeff Bridges, it took him a million years to sort of get the recognition he deserved because he was just kind of like, <laughs> you know what I mean? That doesn't often get rewarded. You know what I mean? So I, I just, it's really hard. You can't grade or judge art, I don't think. So it's to keep it alive. It's to keep it going. I don't think we can put that much stock in any award. Yeah. But that's just my thing. Okay. Please. Thank you for spending time with us. I've quite enjoyed the conversation. Um, I have a short question about the episode, but I feel like I have to give you a little bit of background. Okay. Uh, it was prompted by a couple of things you said. One was that we live in times of fear. Completely agree on that one. And the second thing was that technology is sort of a benign force, and if I'm paraphrasing you right, mm -hmm. um, a lot of what we're seeing in the technological realm is a reflection of what we've asked for, or what we need in some sense. I'm not quite sure about that. Mm. And the reason I think is there's something else in the middle, which is the intentions and the character of the people who are deploying this technology. So my question in your episode about, and this is my budding criticism of Black Mirror as well, I love the show. Yeah. There's not a lot of character around the people who are deploying the technology. So in this episode, Archangel, is, is that a character? Is, it, is that a fully fleshed out character? In, in the episode, or is it just a background? It's a company that's doing these things that real oh, people. When you say people, oh, people that employ, that make the, yeah, the device. Yeah, anyone behind, is it, is it just a blank thing? Mm. We know it's a company, it's providing this product, or is there yes. a oh, yes. that? Well, that's an interesting question. I'm yeah. gonna take that one back to Charlie. I'm gonna send him that, because he's always looking for new ideas, you know? He's always looking for new ideas, and maybe that's something that he'll look to in the future. And this, it really is not, absolutely not about the company that made it. There's, it, you're absolutely right. It is, it is not a character in the piece. It is just this benign blender. And uh, it is much more about the intimacy between a, a mother and a daughter. But um, I'm gonna write that. I think you're gonna get a story thing. credit, actually. <laughs> yeah. I look forward to all of it. Thank yeah. You. Hi, um, I am a little starstruck. Oh. Uh, it doesn't happen very often, uh, but I've been following you. I just turned 50. And um, uh, my question is more about uh, writing. I'm a writer and uh, a mother also of three who's trying to uh, get the mojo back and get going on, on that and find my way. Um, as, as it pertains to writing, I was wondering uh, within your careers if uh, there was a particular piece particular film, particular scene uh, that just always comes back to you. Um, that's part A, and mm -hmm. part B is, um, is there uh, something fun you're reading now? <laughs> ah. Mm. Well, he's the writer, so he's probably the best one to answer that question. But, um, <laughs> um, you know, uh, uh, the, the scene that I always remember that uh, hit me when I was probably 13 or 14 years old is... Um, in the Deer Hunter, and it's the uh, Russian roulette scene. Mm -hmm. And um, every time that I see that scene, I see just how amazing, what, how the construction of that scene is, and um, so much of it, uh, almost none of it, I think, is scripted. And so much of it is, um, is, is, is about listening to all of these uh, people screaming in Vietnamese next to the characters, and they're trying to have a conversation, two men are trying to have a conversation while they're playing Russian roulette, while they're these people that are torturing them and screaming at them. And um, that's amazing writing. And um, I, 
I think that happened in the moment. I think it was just a setup of saying, Here, here's the setup. These are, this, this is a life or death situation between two people who have known each other and who are making these decisions. And now they just let, let it go and let, they, let the, they let the scene happen. And to me, that's you know, the most brilliant writing. I came out of the theater, so for me, so many of my influential moments were seeing people on stage. And you know, I saw Angels in America when I was in college, and I was like, I have to do whatever that is. <laughs> if I could be so lucky to be a part of it, I will give up everything. Um, I re for me, Magnolia was a big turning point. Just Paul Thomas Anderson in general. There's something that the, there's a risk taking. There's a, a logic to it all that's his own. I'm really moved by individuality. So I, I feel like I mean I have no advice, but I know what you mean about getting back on. But I just feel like all the, the jewels are in us. You know what I mean? I'm so interested in what like again Greta like that's her some something personal. I'm so interested in what people have to offer rather than that formula that's been in Hollywood of like, oh, Wonder Woman's a hit. Now let's go do three superhero movies with women. You know, like that's boring. I would love to know your struggle or your triumph, you know, so that, but I don't know how to write, so I don't know. <laughs> you know, you um, do. I apologize, we're only gonna be able to take two more questions, so I apologize to anybody else who's lined up, but we'll do one more from here and one more from there and then we're out of time, I'm sorry about that. All right, okay, um, it's actually my first day here in New York. I'm all oh. the way from Manila, Philippines. And um, yeah, uh, back home, Black Mirror is a big thing, big deal. Like huh. everybody I know watches it there. Where, where are you from? Manila. Philippines. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and um, uh, but my question isn't really necessarily about Black Mirror. It's about uh, whenever you, um, in conversations about the creative process, I've been trained. We've been trained to that uh, that learning is has a lot to do with unlearning. And I'd like to know if there are, even at this point in your career, or even more so now, um, are there points um, where you thought that, when you reflected upon that, where learning is more about unlearning? Oh, that's a really interesting idea. Ooh, I like to hear that. <sighs> <laughs> Yeah. Kind of like when you um, mm -hmm. uh, see your, because right yes. now you've learned so much and you sort of are, have this distanciation between you yeah. and your past um, where you were just, you know, taking and, and absorbing everything and maybe is there a point where you come back, you reflect and see um, maybe the things that I n know now are things that I've always known, it's just that now there are so many things you reinforcing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I had that experience with my first film, which I had, you know, manicured. I knew everything that I wanted, and everything was, you know, I had lists with numbers. And in some ways, that's how I approached the other actors, and um, who did not take too kindly to that approach. <laughs> um, and I really learned by the time I got to my second movie that I was much more interested in letting things happen, and then herding things uh, in terms of the actors and to be ready physically with the technical aspects. So whether it's lenses or production design or other choices that you may have made, you're ready to capture the moment. And I'm gonna be working on that for the rest of my life because I'm a control freak. So <laughs> I'm, that's something that I have to beat myself on the head every single day as a director is, is you know, allowing myself to pay attention to the moment that's happening and then ask questions of it. You know, well, is it because of this, or do you like that, or you know, to ask questions as opposed to impose a pre preconceived idea that I have. Oh, Jody, um, <laughs> I I know nothing ever. You know what I mean? So <laughs> I <laughs> I'm the opposite of Jody. I have no lift. <laughs> I show up. I if I'm I want to keep growing. So as long as these projects and people, like there's always people to learn from. I mean, the best place you can ever be is to feel like everything you know is wrong and you're like starting over from scratch. I feel like, and I'm so glad also to have craft and, and, and you know, I still take acting classes. I love, you know, studying. Um, and I'm curious to see where we can change the art forms. Like there's all these new platforms. I was reading some poetry by Marie Howe and I was like, how come she can't be in a movie? You know, like I want to learn new ways to tell stories. And so I want to be next to people who do it really well. 
and you know, or Greta or anyone and see how we can, we have to evolve it all forward anyway. So I'm curious of like what the next frontier is, but I don't know, but you'll be doing it probably. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks. Hi, um, my question relates to all we've been discovering about the horrible mistreatment of women by Hollywood. And yes. Ms. Foster, it got me thinking about a movie I'm old enough to have seen when it first came out, um, Taxi Driver. Uh -huh. And yeah. people thought you were being horribly oh my exploited and everything. And But from what I read, you really weren't being mistreated as an actor. And I'm wondering if decades later you have just memories and thoughts to share about your experience acting in that movie as a very young prostitute. Oh, it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was me. Um, no, I mean, you're right. It was an amazing experience. Um, I, I had made more movies at that point than either Robert De Niro or, or uh, Martin Scorsese. And, um, <laughs> uh, and, and yes, I was 12 years old. Uh, and, and I remember, you know, obviously the, everybody was concerned that maybe my morals would be corrupted or that I would, you know, they were worried about the atmosphere and to make sure that I was protected. Um, and the welfare board in particular uh, was very concerned with making sure that, you know, I was okay psychologically, et cetera. And it came time to, had to do rehearsals for the scene and there's some scenes where I, you know, unzip his pants and things like that. And I remember, I was just talking about it today, I mean, I remember Martin Scorsese and Robert De Niro standing in the room with me, and they started to talk, but then one would start giggling, and then the other one would start giggling, and they just couldn't, they couldn't get it out, and, and um, I said, do you mean, would you like me to unzip his fly? And then and they were like, yes, but not now. <laughs> uh, and um, they just really couldn't have been more protective and, and more interested in my welfare. I mean, isn't that amazing? Yeah. That that was true, that there were, yeah. there were really good men. Um, and, you know, they were really good men to me. Yeah. And I don't know how else they are with other people, but I know that they were really good men to me. Yeah. And uh, a lot of the opportunities that I were given were from these great father figures. Um, yeah. So it's very hard for me to uh, not also see the good in the movie business that raised me yeah. uh, to be an ethical person. Yeah, and I've so loved following your career all these decades. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Cool. Thank you both so much for being here with us, for sharing your time and your candor. And thank you all for coming. Thank you.